Our first lesson comes from the book of Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verses 9 through 14. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors when you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will go up into heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. Here ends our first lesson. Our second lesson comes from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, so that you may have all endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here ends our second lesson. Our gospel lesson is according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 25 through 37. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan while traveling came upon him, and when he saw him he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
Greetings, sisters and brothers in Christ. The title of our message for this week is The Merciful Samaritan. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So in one week, I go on a two-week vacation with my sister to Europe, a trip that has been canceled two years in a row due to COVID. So I'm praying it actually happens this year. Um, and it begins with a few days visiting cousins in Germany. I went to Germany before following in the footsteps of Luther, but one of my regrets is that I was not able to go to a concentration camp. So on this trip, we have reservations while we're in Germany to go to Dachau. And I've wanted to go to a concentration camp, not that you really want to go, but I felt in my heart that I really should go ever since I was in college and I took a course on the Holocaust. Um, and being partly of German descent, I just feel that it is something I, I should do. And uh, when I took this course on the Holocaust as an undergraduate student, there were so many times during the semester when I thought, what am I doing? Why am I taking this course that is just really plunging me into depression and the darkest side of humanity? And it actually was a course, um, it was called the Holocaust, but it actually was a whole history of various forms of human prejudice and scapegoating and racism. Really, really, without a doubt, the most um, emotionally difficult, challenging course I've ever taken. And we watched several films during that course. And one of, and one of them, I will never forget. It was about today's gospel, the Good Samaritan. And in this film, it was just a short film clip, maybe 15 minutes. It was based on an actual study of seminary students who were given today's gospel about the Good Samaritan, Jesus' greatest commandment to love God and others as we love ourselves, and then the Good Samaritan. And these seminary students were told to ponder that story, pray with that story, and prepare a sermon on that story. And then they were each given a separate time slot to show up at this building at the sem seminary at a certain, on a certain day at a certain time. And they had it staged so that as these seminary students entered the building, there in the entrance was a person who cried out for help and then collapsed to the ground. Now, it was an actor, but they didn't know that. And the film clip showed seminary student after seminary student walking right on by this person calling out for help and then collapsing on the floor. It was horrifying to watch. Now, before we jump in, as I admit I did right away, I jumped in and judged those seminary students. How could they do that? How horrible is that? Weren't they even thinking about the, the very story that they were supposed to be preaching, you know, preaching on? In, 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 in just a few moments, didn't they take it to heart? But before we judge them, myself included, judge them, um, the point of every story Jesus tells is not that we judge others, but that we examine our own hearts. And that is really the first reading from today, from the book of Deuteronomy. It says, 
you know, God's word, God's law, God's teaching, Torah, right, is not something that is too hard or too far away from us. No, the book of Deuteronomy says. It's not something that's up in heaven that we have to send someone up to heaven to get it for us and bring it down. And it's not something that's like across the ocean that we have to sail across the farthest sea to get it. No, the book of Deuteronomy says, it is very near to us. It is on our lips. It is in our mouths and in our hearts. So today we are invited to, to really examine our hearts and are the words on our lips and what's in our hearts in sync? Are there, is there a congruity between those two things? Um, so let's look at today's gospel a little more deeply. It says a lawyer came up to Jesus. Now that's not our modern day understanding of lawyer. A lawyer in the New Testament meant an expert in the Jewish law, an expert in the Torah, okay? So a religious Torah, religious law expert came up to Jesus and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus turned it right back at him and said, well, you're the expert. You know the law. It's on your lips. Is it in your heart? How do you read it? And so the man responds with what we have come to know and which the other gospels put in the lips of Jesus as Jesus's greatest commandment. And Jesus didn't make up his greatest commandment. He took it from two parts of the two verses of the Torah, the introduction to the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy, and this little verse from Leviticus. And Jesus put them together and says, um, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you are to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then we read something very interesting because it says this young, this man, this lawyer, this expert in the Torah said, wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So that little verse, wanting to justify himself, tells us a lot. It tells us that he might have had the Torah the law of God on his lips, but he didn't have it fully in his heart because his heart was full of self, of ego, of wanting to justify himself. And again, we need to examine our own hearts. And, and so in the time of the Hebrew Bible, there were different interpretations. We see this throughout the Hebrew Bible, different interpretations of Torah. And there was a very narrow interpretation, which um, perhaps this young, this lawyer was, was um, all about, which said um, the commandments apply only to other fellow Jews, to other members of the community of faith. But those outsiders, those Moabites and Amorites and Canaanites, etc., those Philistines, etc., it doesn't apply to them. It's just, you know, love your Jewish neighbor as you love yourself. Then you had the prophets who came along and said, no, 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 no. It doesn't just apply to our fellow Jews. It applies to all people. And they really... Um, it challenged our Jewish ancestors to, to have a broader, more expansive understanding of Torah, okay? And Jesus clearly has this broader, more expansive version of Torah because Jesus responds like this. G the, the man says, who is my neighbor? Wanting to just, justify himself, he asks, who is my neighbor? And Jesus' response is the story of the Good Samaritan, which incidentally is found only in the Gospel of Luke 
And Luke is the only gospel, canonical gospel, written by a non-Jew, a Gentile. Um, so that's quite interesting. And in this gospel, we see a couple things. Um, we see Jesus giving this much broader, more expansive view of Torah because Jesus comes back and says, um, not only are, to you are you to love your fellow Jews, but you're to love all others, even one, people who have made horrible choices and, you know, you might say deserve the boat they're in, and two, people you hate. You are to love them as you love yourself and as you love God. Now I say this because Jesus tells the story of a person who's on his way, on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. So the entire audience would be like, that's like a red flashing neon sign saying, what? Who in their right mind would travel this notoriously dangerous, treacherous road alone? What was he thinking? He was asking for it. Okay, and sometimes we do that. We judge others thinking, well, they're in that boat because they made horrible choices. What were they thinking? They deserve that. They asked for that. And Jesus is saying, hey, even if they made horrible choices and, and are partly responsible for the boat they're in, guess what? You are to love them, specifically them, as you love yourself. And then Jesus tells the story of a priest who, like those seminary students, walked on by this guy who was lying in a ditch, crying for help, collapsed, like those seminary students' scenario. A Levite, um, another, uh, like a lay minister, worker in the temple, walked right on by. But who stops to help the guy? A Samaritan. Well, guess what? If you know anything about the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, there's this long history of Samaritans as people that Jews were extremely prejudiced against and hated, okay? Because in Jewish history, when the Jews were conquered by their enemies, they, their enemies took the elite Jews, the highly educated priests, cream of the crop people into exile and left the poor, uneducated peasants to work and farm the land and produce food for their conquerors. And as always happens in the case of war, the conquerors uh, took the Jewish women, had children with them, and so the Samaritans became a mixed race. So we come full circle back to that course I took as an undergraduate on this whole history of human prejudice, scapegoating, and racism, which, as we can tell when we watch the news, is still alive and well today, right? Well, Jesus turns the person, the Samaritan, the person um, most hated by Jews because they're a mixed race. They're uh, also, in addition to racism going on, there was elitism. The Samaritans were not educated like these pure Jews who'd been taken into exile. They weren't as educated or pure in their religion or wealthy. And so there were all kinds of prejudice going on. And Jesus says, that very person you hate is the hero of the story. That's the one who truly was a neighbor to that foolish guy who was walking from Jerusalem to Jericho alone. So, sisters and brothers, Jesus comes right back at this man who had the words on his lips, but perhaps not yet fully in his heart. And Jesus said, who of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, 
was truly a neighbor to this person. And the lawyer responded, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus responds, yes, do this, do this, go and do likewise. Do this and you will live. And the Greek word for mercy is poesis. And it literally, it has a big long definition in my Greek dictionary and it says um, doing, doing, acting, putting into action, doing mercy. Okay, so it can't just be words on our lips. It also has to be understanding in our hearts and not hearts filled with self, but hearts open and, and filled with God, with Christ, with spirit, and therein with love, true love of all neighbors. So sisters and brothers, um, the Catholic Church speaks of seven acts of mercy. I teach at Salve Regina, a Sisters of Mercy school. That word mercy literally means action, doing, putting this word of God, putting our faith into action, living it, living this great commandment of Jesus, of loving God and others as we love ourselves. And in the Catholic Church, they define seven works of mercy from the Gospel of Matthew, where people say to Jesus, when did we see you hungry and give you food or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you naked and clothe you or in prison and visiting and visit you or an alien and shelter you, etc.? And Jesus says, remember, truly as you did to the littlest ones, to the least of my sisters and brothers, to the Samaritans and the foolish people and the people who are in that boat because they deserved it or they made bad choices. Truly, Jesus says, as you do unto them, as you do mercy unto them, so you do unto me. May Christ's word to us today be not just on our lips, but in our hearts and in our actions, in the way we live this mercy toward others. Amen. There's a whiteness in God's mercy, like the whiteness of the sea. There's a kindness in
And now may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May God look upon us with blessing and grant us peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve God and the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.